look forward to uh, the four lessons that will be presented today. Uh, we're going to have a lesson here in just a few moments by Brother Steve Monts, who has been here before. I think the last time was 10 years ago. And the church here, for those that are not aware, they supported him in the work, I believe, in Franklin, Kentucky. I know for at least the last 10 years, I think longer than that. And so it's certainly great, uh, good to have him here with us. And we look forward to the lessons that he is going to be presenting to us uh, from Moses. Uh, after the lesson here at the 10 o'clock hour, we'll take a brief break. And then at the 11 o'clock hour, Brother John Duvall will be presenting his lesson for this morning. And we look forward to that lesson. And then after that, we'll take a break. And then we'll come back at 2 o'clock this afternoon for two more lessons at the 2 o'clock and at the 3 o'clock hour. Among our visitors here with us are his Brother Nolan, uh, Nolan Glover. And we help to support and work at Kennett. We're grateful for him being here. We're going to ask him in just a moment to lead us in our opening prayer, and at the conclusion of the prayer, then we'll turn the remainder of the hour over to Brother Steve Mock. For all those that are visiting with us, we want you to know that you're our honored guest. Uh, we're glad to be glad that you're here. Your presence encourages us, lets us know you're interested in spiritual things, and encourage you to come back and be with us at any opportunity that you can. You know, we'll meet tomorrow at 9 and at 10 for our regular times in the morning. Then tomorrow afternoon, we'll meet at 4 o'clock for the uh, third lecture of the day, and then at the 5 o'clock hour for our regular worship service. This time, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Nolan to lead us in the Word of Will. Thank you. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we're so thankful unto you for this day of life. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to be together, to hear these three men, to preach your word, lessons, they have prepared lessons that we need to understand and to practice in our lives. We pray that we will learn much and that we will uh, apply to our lives. We pray, Father, that you uh, be with us, be with this congregation as they seek to teach your word in this community and to grow. We pray that you bless them in spiritual growth that will lead to numerical growth. We pray, Father, that you would uh, bless our country and its leaders. We pray, Father, for good leaders that will return to the belief in you and the morals of your word. We are thankful, Father, for many blessings that we have, and especially this opportunity that we have to come together again to be able to uh, meet Pray, Father, that the COVID will soon be a past memory. And that is your will. We pray, Father, that you would continue to be with us. And we ask that you forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Word 
together. I've selected for us uh, this uh, series on Moses for my three lessons. And it's important that we understand that for the health and soundness of a congregation, that it has a steady diet of doctrinal sermons. Uh, that's so we know what we ought to do and to stay sound with the Lord. But it's also important for us to recognize that there are times that we need to think and meditate on the narratives of Scripture, because the Scripture is filled with narratives where you're able to see individuals as they live and operate and seeking to do God's will in their particular time. And then you see God work with them and through them. And that offers us encouragement as we seek to do the same today for our God as well. And oftentimes, it gives insight as to why God has chosen a particular way that we're to follow Him, a particular doctrine that we must uh, adorn and respect in our lives. Because we recognize through these studies of narratives that God always knows what's best. That He and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so when we study the lives of individuals in Scripture and see God work with them, we see that that is the case all the time. Years ago, I started this study on the life of Moses. It ended up being a 27-part series. You get to be introduced just the first three, the beginning of Moses. And I've done this a number of places because I think there is a lot to learn from the beginning uh, of the story of anybody. To understand their background and where they have come from helps you better understand where they end up going. Before we look at the first lesson entitled The Making of a Great Leader, I want to give you first maybe some clip notes, some introductory notes regarding Moses and why it's beneficial for us to study Moses. The first five books of the Bible were considered Israel's Bible for many, many years. And the book of Deuteronomy, if you'd like to turn there, Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and read with me verses 4 through 8, we see how important it was for them to study it and to meditate on it. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command your day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so they were to be immersed in the will and law of God. It was to be a constant meditation of their mind and their heart and to be shared within their family. And so we see God's import in regards to their private life. But later on in Deuteronomy chapter 31, we see how it would be important in their public life as well. In fact, just before the death of Moses, he sets forth the process by which public teaching, regular congregational meetings, where they come together to consider God's Word, that that would be established essentially in the time of Moses. In Deuteronomy 31 there, verse 12, he says, Gather the people together, men and women, and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear, and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God, and to carefully observe all the words of this law. And so, what you and I are doing today first started there with Moses, the gathering of people together to hear God's Word. And so there's a tremendous impact of Moses upon the narrative of history, not just with public teaching, but even into New Testament times. In fact, as we journey to the New Testament, you learn that the law of Moses is still binding during the life of Christ in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus, before he launches into his great sermon on the mount, wants to make sure that he's not misunderstood. In Matthew 5, there, verse 19, he even says in verse 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not 
one jot or one tittle shall pass away until all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches them so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. It was binding in the time of Christ until it was nailed to the cross of Christ. You even learn in the New Testament, Moses makes an appearance. In Matthew chapter 17, there in verse 3, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus met with Moses and Elijah. And I always like that tender scene there, because one of the things that leaves his heart broken about Moses is that at the end of his life, he wasn't able to go into the promised land as he so desired. But there you see in the time of Christ, he's there in the land. But it's of no consequence. It's as if it doesn't even matter because he's in a better promised land by that point in time. In fact, that entire discussion was all about Christ and what he was going to do and soon accomplish on the cross. It was not about Moses in the promised land. Moses' words revealed many unknown things about Jesus Christ. And that was by God's design. In John chapter 1, John chapter 1, there in verse 45, John 1, 45, the record tells us Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. And so they recognized Jesus was the fulfillment of what Moses was writing about and speaking about. In chapter 3, there in verse 14, remember that time when Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness so those that were snake bit might look and live? Jesus makes the application to himself. In 3 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Then in chapter 6 and verse 32 of John, here again Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. As the, men, the, the Israelites needed that manna that fell from heaven so they might live, he says that was symbolic. That was just a shadow of me who comes down to heaven so that men and women might spiritually live. In John chapter 5, there in verse 46, Jesus told the Jews, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. So a lot of the writings there of, of Moses are finding fulfillment in Christ Jesus. In fact, you would even note if you want to turn to Romans 10, 19, Moses revealed the inclusion of even the Gentiles. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 9, Moses revealed the support of creatures. He said, Paul, he made that application. Was it, was it Austin that God was concerned about? Muslim. No. He had those that be workers in the kingdom of God. Moses even foreshadowed conversion and baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. As the Israelites went through the Red Sea, surrounded by water on both sides, and a cloud over the top. So they were baptized into Moses. Made a parallel of Paul did by divine inspiration to those who were baptized into Christ. Even Moses' shining face foreshadowed the fame of the Old Testament law as the glory of his face faded back into normal. So much is said there in the New Testament that came first from Moses, even resurrection. In Luke 20, there in verse 37, Luke 20, 37, Jesus said, But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead our race. When he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, for he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. He 
It's really hard to grasp the profound and far-reaching effects of Moses on history and on life. Indeed, he is a type of Christ, or truly one greater than Moses would come. But not many greater than Moses existed before. And when you think about the life of Christ compared to the life of Moses, there's indeed a great typical imprint that is given. Think about it. Both had an obscure birth. Both had peril in infancy. Both were protected in Egypt. Both were rejected by their brethren. Both were called out of Egypt. For both little is known about their early years of life. Both are sent into the wilderness. And both are called out of the wilderness at just the right time. Forty years for Moses and forty days for Christ. It is true, as Jesus said, he wrote about me. So you can see a great need for us to study someone like Moses in the Scriptures. And so, without further ado, let us begin there at the beginning of the story. Turn to Exodus <coughs> chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. And let's begin reading the first seven verses together. Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. Now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man and his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Nephali, Gad, and Asher. All those who were descendants of Jacob were seventy persons, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, all his brothers and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. The Exodus record begins with the word now, N-O-W, because Moses is the one that is writing it. And he had just finished the record of Joseph some three, four hundred years before him. And so then he fast forwards to his present time and writes the word now. But really to understand the beginning of Moses' journey, you have to first get to Joseph. Why is Moses and the Israelites in Egypt at all? When you think about Joseph, he makes up a big, a big part of the end of Genesis chapters 37 through 50. More is written about Joseph than there was written about Abraham. You learn as a teen, he was hated by his brothers. And eventually swindled and sold as a slave. Then he sent to prison. And somehow against all odds, is eventually lifted up by God to become the treasurer or vice president, in essence, of the most powerful nation of that day. Then famine comes across the land. Meanwhile, his family back in Canaan land begins to starve. And his brothers are sent out there to retrieve food. Joseph knows that he can save them. And after repentance is evidence, he then reveals himself to his brothers, and blessings would come from the hand of Joseph. To his family. In Genesis 45, we might just turn back a little bit. In Genesis 45, there in verse 5, when he reveals himself, he says in verse 5, But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. He recognized the almighty divine hand of providence behind all of this. Verse 6. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God, and has made me a father of Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do 
not tarry. So they begin to make the long journey. Here comes a small band of refugees. They could have fit on two school buses. And when they arrive, they're not herded like cattle into some fenced-off refugee camp to eat by an existence. But God gives them prime real estate, Goshen. And for the next 71 years of Joseph's life, things go very smoothly. As we come to the end of Joseph's life, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 22, it says, So Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children of Machmir, the son of Manasseh, were also brought up on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So Moses leaves the record of Joseph with that great promise that there would be a time coming in which they would leave the land of Egypt after some time, and they would even carry the bones of Joseph with them out of that land. Well, like I said, for quite some time, things went smoothly for the Israelites in the land of Egypt. But after some subtle changes happened, Israel's stock drops like it's 1929, and a great depression comes upon them. They now become the two million in the refugee camp by the time we flip one page to the word now in Exodus. Now how did this happen? How did they become despised? When you think about it, it's not much different on how it works within other nations and other cultures throughout time. Satan has limited tools that he uses, and he just uses them over and over again. That's why we come up with the phrase, history repeats itself. Because he just keeps using those same tools over and over again to fool man. He is the father of lies, and he's the end of his work since the beginning. So you look at how it happens in other histories, of how people become despised in other nations' eyes. You see, suspicion and time becomes prejudice. Prejudice becomes persecution. And persecution of unchecked becomes genocide. Just see Rome to the first Christians. Just see Hitler to the Jews. Or even more closer to our present day, 1994 in Rwanda, where in four, in four, in four months, one million Tutsis were killed. That was 70% of them. See, Satan's process is the same. It's the people and the circumstances and the time are the only things that really change. Now, we have some clues given to us as to how some of this suspicion becomes prejudice in time. When they move to Egypt, Joseph is very careful to warn his family, don't announce that you're shepherds. Because shepherds are an abomination to Egyptians. See, Egypt saw themselves as high society, very advanced for the day and time, in contrast to shepherds. They were like the hillbillies. Some of you might remember the old Beverly Hillbillies, right? The, 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 the guys that come into Beverly Hills with the overalls and suspenders, they just kind of stick out from everybody else. Everybody thumbs their nose up at them. But it was similar for Egypt to shepherds as well. They had to find universities and the abundance. And they forgot in time that it was Joseph really that built a lot of that abundance for them. In fact, there's monuments that they have, pictures where shepherds are portrayed as lanky and withered and distorted and ghostly figures. So Joseph, you know, when they first come in, he wants to keep all that generic, you know. Let's not start off on the wrong sandal. But in time, of course, those things become known. Ironically, later those very sheep that they would shepherd 
would save a nation of two million, while high society in Egypt would perish. Because they would have the lambs that could be slaughtered, where the doorposts and lentils could be painted with the blood. It reminds me of what Paul later says in the New Testament, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.27 well, back there in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He becomes the forgotten man. The crown has passed too many heads until it was ancient history. And so things begin to change with the Israelites in Egypt. Verse 9, And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come. Let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happened in the event of war, that they also join our enemies and fight against us and go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. So they see how Israel is flourishing. Indeed, God was blessing them. And so they say, this seems like it could be a future threat. We need to stomp and stamp this out right away. Lest they join our enemies in the event of war. The ironic thing is, is that by them doing this, they're actually bringing on and hastening that war. They didn't realize that. The very thing they feared they're going to bring about. So that eventually in Exodus chapter 12, when Israel leaves Egypt, the Bible describes them as the armies of Israel. And they didn't even fire one shot or throw one stone. God fought for them. And the armies of Israel would leave Egypt in time. Hastened by this very thing that Pharaoh is bringing about. God knew that in time the Israelites would reach out for him again. And deliverance would come. And his name would be Moses. Before Moses was born, things go from bad to much, much worse. Look there in verse 12. And the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied the group. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, and mortar, and brick, and all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shakur, and the name of the other was Puma. And he said, when you do the duties of the midwife of the Hebrew women and see to them on the birth stools, if it's a son, then you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded, but saved the male children alive. All things go from very bad to very worse. But slowly, these processes begin to be implemented. Kind of like the Nazis in the 20th century for the Jews. There's first the denouncing of the Jews in the press. Second is the denial of privileges. Third, the confiscation of property. Fourth, then wearing badges to make them be noticed as enemies. And then last comes the boxcars and the concentration camps and the chemical showers, the ovens and the firing squad. You see, when you break down humans' humanity, in time, you don't see them as that anymore. And they become expendable. <clears throat> Their lives become expendable. I must admit that we're not too far from that ourselves. In a country that now celebrates and promotes abortion, <clears throat> or euthanasia, life becomes expendable. It's cheap. It can be removed. Well, what you see here is two godly women, pro-life women. And why were they pro-life? Verse 17 says that the midwives 
feared God and would not do as the king of Egypt had commanded, but saved the male children alive. Thank God for Shapara and Pua. They were in the right place at the right time. And the Bible tells us something. Those that fear God are for life. So is it any surprise in a country that is a long time since forgotten how to fear God that we see more and more individuals that are saying, no, no, it's the woman's body. It's her right. It's her choice. What about the choice of that unborn child? These women feared God and they said, we're not going to do this. We're not going to take the step. We're not going to take in some life. He won't do it. Verse 18 says, So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing? And save the male children alive. And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are likely to give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. So it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born, you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Now, often the question comes through this process for the midwives dishonest in all of this. Probably. Maybe, but I also have to say, maybe not as well. I tend to think that they lied. However, I must admit it's possible that the Hebrew women were lively and very fast, and it was it, and there it is. There's a child, you know. Possible. Or it's also possible they gave instructions to the husband or others that may have been there and said, you know, here's what you're going to have to do in this situation so that when we finally come on the scene, the baby's already there. I can only imagine those instructions were given to me. Whew, I'd be as wide as a sheet, you know. I, I gotta do what? <laughs> but you know what? Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to save that little innocent life. And here's what I do know. Verse 21, it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. God rewarded them for their piety, not deceit. Deceit never pleases God. But he rewards them for doing what was right in his eyes. God valued life, so they valued life. And they recognize it's better than God rather than men. Acts 5 and verse 29. Now I want to stop here for a moment and drive down a little peg. There's, there's a couple of lessons that we learn. I, in fact, I called this series Moses Lessons for Living because there are so many applications that we can make to our lives. One of the first applications I make from this is that what Egypt was doing ultimately was because they were afraid of Israel. Chapter 1 and verse 12. And that made me realize that under the rock of brutality is often fear. Egypt was afraid of Israel. And so they sought to harm them. In my 20 some years of preaching and counseling and helping individuals and brethren, I've often noted that brutal and angry people are often driven by fear. Fear of loss, fear of humiliation, fear of exposure, fear of weakness, fear of growing up, fear of people, fear of losing control, fear of the past, fear of the future, fear of the present. And friend, if you're prone to anger, and fits of violence or harshness. It might be wise to stop and to ask yourself, what is it that you're so afraid of? The Bible tells us to cast our cares upon Him, for He cares for us. And we're admonished to lean on Christ and to learn from the Holy Spirit when He says, be not afraid. Second lesson I learned for living is that hard times doesn't mean that God forgets. 
And that's a good lesson for us in our, in our day as the brother prayed about the pandemic and how we all wish it was a thing of the past. But even in, through the midst of it all, in our struggles and difficulties, God doesn't forget us. He doesn't forget His promises. It doesn't mean He's unconcerned or He doesn't notice. Because God cannot forget. God always cares and He always notices. Now we may forget and we may not care and we may not take note, but not God. It's impossible. And oftentimes people in their struggle say, well, I don't see Him in the midst of all of this. And neither did the Hebrews in the midst of their struggle and their plight. And yet, God was there unmistakably. It was not an accident that the record then says next, Moses was born in these times. Exodus 2, verse 1. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, a beautiful child, she hid him three months. It was no mistake that Moses was born then. And I believe, friends, it's no accident that you and I are born in this particular era too. God provides now as He provided then. Often folks will say, well, I just don't think I'm really seek God in my life. I don't know if I'm really making an impact. Friends, God will use you if you'll be willing to be used obediently. But I'm not making a difference. I'm no, no Moses. Surely I'm not something grand then. But you may need to adjust your definition of grand. Have you been obedient? Then you are grand in God's eyes. And you are making an impact whether you see it or not. I promise you, you are. Years and years ago, I, I wasn't raised among conservative congregations. I was raised among liberal churches of Christ. That's how I was introduced to the Bible. My mother and father were wed. My mother was always conservative. And I never understood why she would always go to a different congregation, even though it was a church of Christ. How hard that must have been for her. She kept praying because Dad forced the children to go with him. Praying one day that God would give us the opportunity and the life and the health to be able to make our own choices. And have a heart that's willing to study the differences. But year after year after year after year, she was attending by herself, making very long drives to the assembly, sometimes over an hour. Depending on where we lived at that time. <clears throat> she may have thought, I'm not making any difference. I'm not having any impact at all. One time, my brother studied the differences first, and he left, convinced that where we were at didn't have authority for the things they were doing. Three years later, I studied out and left. And a few years after me, my sister studied out and left. And now, me and my brother are both full-time evangelists. Well, he's taking a little sabbatical right now. My sister's a member of a conservative work. See, we need to adjust our definition of grand. If we're being obedient to God, we can and will be used by God for His glory. But imagine if she didn't make that stand. I don't think I'd be here before you today. See, when we're talking about the making of a great leader, we have to understand that great leaders aren't born. They are made. And when we think about the great leader Moses, we have to recognize that there'd be no Moses without his parents. Do you know the names of Moses' parents? A lot of folks don't remember those names. You have to go to chapter 6 before you actually hear or read of their names. Amram and Jacobin 
are their names. And when you think about their names, you begin to realize that the grandparents of Moses were also very godly individuals as well. The name Amram means exalted people. And who names their child exalted people in the midst of all their suffering and slavery that they're going through? Someone that fears God. Someone that trusts God. And Jochebed's parents named her Jochebed, which means glory unto Jehovah. Again, it requires a parent of faith to be able to see the glory of Jehovah in the midst of all their suffering and trial. And that godly influence of Moses' grandparents would be passed down to his parents, which then would be passed down until Moses would arrive. So it's no accident that they were then, or you and I are now. God knew them, and He even honors them in the privileged hall of faith. Did you ever notice that? In Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, we may not notice that because it mentions the name Moses, but it actually says the parents of Moses. Hebrews chapter 11, there in verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents. Well, Moses can do anything by faith three months old. It was his parents. They said, we're going to trust God with this and pray that it works out. Are you having an impact? Are you being obedient? And think about it. Amram and Jochebed, they were consistent. It was not just a one shot with Moses. They raised an Aaron and a Miriam too. Which grow on to be very highly influential among the Jewish community. Back there in Exodus chapter 2. You know, they, they're having a third child during these very difficult times. And I'll be honest, before I had children, I struggled with thoughts like that. So I really want to bring children to the world like this. So much has changed. So much has changed in my small, short lifetime. Now, I want to introduce them into a society like this. And it really was a struggle for me for some time. And I remember when it finally clicked with me. You know that song, Because He Lives? There's one stanza that talks about holding that newborn baby. Right? You feel the pride and joy that he gives? I know that the child can face tomorrow because he lives. So I remembered and I recognized God doesn't want us to stop living because times are difficult, but rather keep living for him in spite of difficult times because he lives. The trust that he knows what is ahead, even though we cannot see around the corner. Well, that's exactly what Amram and Jochebed did. They had Miriam, who would be about 11 at this time, Aaron 3, and they think, let's have another. That's a lot of trust. That's a lot of trust in God. The Bible tells us they hit him for three months, but they couldn't do it anymore. Because we know they're, they're getting bigger, and the vocal cords are getting louder, and you know, anyone that's had children, you know what that's like, that feeling in the morning and in the night and in all times of day. You know, there were some times we had triplets, as a lot of you know, at the beginning. There were some times we wished for three little arcs and some bulrushes that we could kind of shuffle them off to, you know, for a little bit of time. It's, it was difficult. It was hard, but we were blessed. So they think, what do we do with this crying baby? Well, verse 3. When she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done for him. What's the plan? That's the plan? Yeah, that, that's the plan. Well, instantly, my mind's thinking, well, what about when he, he learns to roll around or to crawl a little bit? What, well, he can't swim. So all, all the, the future moments that be coming, I, I, my mind would instantly go to those things. But I love this. What you see in Amram and Jochebed, 
It so beautifully illustrates Matthew 6, verse 34. Do not worry about tomorrow. And this is no tomorrow, just only today. They didn't know all the answers of what was coming. They just knew what to do now, today. Build an ark, a little boat that you can put your boy in so that it would kind of hide and muffle the cry. And it would kind of act like a, a way to deflect the voice, you know. Because the soldiers, if they're coming by, they're, they're not going to look at the river. They're going to look at a house. Where's that sound coming from? Just survive today. That's a lesson for us as well. I don't know about you, but I crossed way too many bridges before I arrived in them. And I need to think more like Hamram and Jochebed. The only problems that exist are those today. Now, I'm not saying don't plan for tomorrow. I'm saying don't worry about it. That's what the Lord said. Don't worry about tomorrow. And so, we're going to plant Miriam not far away, and she can kind of keep an eye on him over there. Now, verse 5. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the baby wept, so there's baby Moses crying. And Pharaoh's uh, assistant, Pharaoh's daughter's assistant, sees, sees the baby. Now imagine, you're Miriam there, you're watching. This is one of those time stand stills moments. You know, we're just, what, what's going to happen next? You know, the, the heart racing, the drill and pumping. Is she just going to pick up Moses and throw him in the river? What, what's going to happen? You ever had one of those moments? I remember not too many years ago, I took the triplets out to bike at the park. And you know how dad is, just, oh yeah, we can go down that hill, no problem. And they did for a few times. Went down a grassy hill. I said, all right, guys, time to go. Well, my daughter wanted to go one more time. And so she started to go down this hill. And I was at the bottom of it. And I could see her eyes as wide as saucers. I realized she forgot her brakes. She was just frozen in fear. She was picking up more and more speed. And I realized this is going to end very, very badly. And I see her as she hits the, uh, the, the, the gravel uh, roadway. She flips over the bike, lands on her head, and she's there before me. And I run to her, and she's unconscious. And I, I flip her over, and there's those few seconds where you're like, Penny, 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 are you okay? Penny, Penny. And it's like time stands still. Is she going to respond? Is, is this it? And if she wakes up, will she be the same? Thank the Lord she did have a, a bike helmet on. And when she did come to, we took her to the ER and did the scan to make sure everything was, was in order. But that's the moment Miriam's experiencing right there. What's going to happen next? This is life or death. <clears throat> well, the Bible says in verse 6, so she had compassion on him. And said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then the, his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? i got to admit, I'm impressed with Miriam. She is thinking fast on her feet. I don't know if I thought that, but she's right there. Oh, hey, can I get a, a nurse for you? One of the Hebrew women. Oh, yes, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And so the maiden went and called the child's mother. And then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away. I mean, she didn't know that was the mother. Not take your child away. I don't think that would have happened. This would not have worked if she knew that was the child's mother. But take this child away and nurse him for me, and I'll give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Isn't that amazing? Absolutely amazing. How many women here would love to be paid just to to raise their child at home. That's what happened to her. It reminded me of Ephesians 5, uh, 3 and verse 20 where he's able to do exceedingly abundantly of all we ask. <coughs> the farthest thing 
from Jochebed's mind it could ever be a possibility. But you see how all that worrying about tomorrow would have come to nothing? She just knew, put him in the boat and trust God. And it worked. So live today and let God take care of tomorrow. She gets to keep paying most for longer under protective custody and even get paid for this. Oh, God is good. And the Bible tells us in chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 10, this is the child grew. The child grew. Now, when I look at this word in the Hebrew, it means it's a little past the weaning stage. So she gets to have him in the growing stage as well. Long enough for her to train and communicate with him. That he might know his family roots. And if he had books of the Bible to memorize, then I'm sure he would have, would have had to memorize too. She would have worked hard on him. She firmly put it in his heart and he would never forget who he was. We need to remember that, parents. When we're talking about the making of a great leader, they're not born, they're made. Yes, the father has an important role to bring up a child the way he should go. Train and nurture and admonition of the Lord. A lot of that father's work takes place as they get a little bit older. Very important mother work starts right away and has a lasting impact. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. You know the, the very famous Proverbs 31 woman? Those are actually the words of mother of King Lemuel. The words of a woman to her son. Look for this kind of woman. You can think about the mother, Eunice of Timothy. Grandmother Lois. You can think about Hannah. And the impact she had on her son Samuel. The truth is no one can take the place of mother. So when you think about it, where do our children then learn of foul language or school dances or immodest clothing or sexual innuendo? It's because often they go into the world, right? And they learn all the ways and instructing the ways of, of Egypt to the neglect of the ways of God. And if we don't constantly push back against that and teach them the way of God and the way of Egypt, we'll try them. The truth is our children will value what we value. Mothers, fathers, do your job well. Because the church, a preacher, a guardian or a daycare can't do it for you. Nobody can take the place of godly parents. It just cannot be done. And so she gets to have Moses in these formative years. And the Bible says in verse 10, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of water. I've tried to picture this a number of times in my mind's eye. Jochebed grabbing little Moses' hand, walking away from the Hebrew camp for the last time as a boy. Probably weeping with each step all the way to the palace. And I picture little Moses saying, What's wrong, Mama? What's wrong? hard that would be. And then his hand being passed off to another woman who's all cleaned up, dolled up, painted eyebrows, that would have scared me to death. Had I been most, I would have wept for many nights. Nothing more soothing than a mother's touch. Nothing more comforting than father's wise words. And all that's gone. <coughs> no more playing and laughing with sister and brother. See, this is not like Hannah and Samuel with visiting privileges. She, the Bible says, she becomes his mother, and he becomes her child, Pharaoh's child. I almost cried when I studied this and tried to picture the last kiss, the last instruction given, the last prayer being offered, the straightening of his little tunic, and the last hug being given. 
And then I began to think, are we really that far off ourselves? I mean, do we remember our last times with our kids? Do we remember that last diaper change? The very last one. Remember the last time you rocked your child to sleep? Remember the last time you did. Remember that last conversation you had before they went to high school or left the home for college? See, swiftly we're turning life to eight pages. Swiftly the hours are changing to years. How are we using God's golden moments? I tell you, Jacob Ed, and Amram filled moment after moment with God. And he never forgot. Because great leaders, friends, are not born, but they're made. And again, this was not a one shot with Moses. They are the parents of Aaron and Miriam as well. And so, though Moses would be instructed in all the ways of Egypt, it did not change who he was inside. It changed his home, it changed his language, it changed his studies, but it didn't change his soul. He knew who he was. So may God give us more Jacobins and Amorites. May we be like that. Remember, parents, to do your job and to do it well. And to realize that you are having an impact. Raising the great leaders of tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. We'll go ahead and stop the study at this time. We'll take a brief break.